Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello and welcome. Joining me today to share the 10 best spiritual books that inspired her definitely less than ordinary life journey is one of Britain's most loved mediums. Famed for her ability to bring comfort, healing, tears and laughter to her audiences, Rebecca Sawyer, fondly known as Bex, has been featured widely across the British media, including the National Good Morning television programme. Her spiritual medium, star being, teacher and sacred medicine practitioner, it wasn't until Bex went through her own physical and emotional transitions as a transgender medium that she really began to develop her clairvoyant abilities and her mediumship skills. And she's been doing that for over 20 years. In fact, she has a very busy schedule with her popular mediumship nights that are really enjoyed by many people across the UK and abroad, her workshops and her unique recreation readings, which have a 12-month waiting list. Beck Sawyer, welcome. Well, thank you so much. I've got really, I've got read. That's a, such a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you. <laughs> so you don't you you don't regard yourself as an avid reader, but you do like reading books. So that tells me you've got to be very very picky about the books that you do read. Is that correct? That's actually quite true. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I won't pick up. I've got this. I've got about six books on my bedside, and some I refer to every so often. And one, there's one I usually try and think, oh, that's the one I'm working through right now. But I'm not the sort of person that gets through a book a month or a book a week. I'm not. I have to be honest, I'm not. Have you always been that way? Um, I suppose when I was at school, you read a lot, and um, I don't know what I went through. I didn't do university, so that might be part of it. Um, but I find if I find a book I enjoy, I will reference it quite a lot. Or I'll go back and reread it. So I tend to, what I loved about doing this, this, this project was finding books. I thought, oh my God, that was so important to me because. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Meaningful and, um, books. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly that. Exactly. That. And things I go, I can remember when I found that book. I can remember the, per in my case, I knew one or two, of the, one of the authors of the book. I go, I know why that's so important to me. And it becomes part of, I think some books, become part it sounds really it might sound a bit weird they become part of you yes yeah yeah they, they become part of, of your whole experience of your whole life experience yeah. because they, they can they can come along a pivotal moment in your life mm. well your your list is too. certainly different you know a lot of, <laughs> you've introduced me to books i'd never heard of in fact you introduced me to one book that sent me on such a goose chase i was having real difficulty finding oh that the book was even available now. We'll get to that oh, one in God. a minute. But let's okay. start with your first book, which is The Celestine okay. Prophecy by James Redfield. Yeah. And this was published in 1993. Do you remember how you came across that book? I This is quite... I, I have a little saying called Freaky Deaky. This is a really freaky deaky story. Uh, before I, This is long before I transitioned, or about 10 years before I, eight, nine years before I transitioned, or started a transition. Um, I'd broken up with a partner and I was in a really bad place and I'd literally just broken up and I'd actually moved, moved back in with my mum and I was in my early 30s and I, no, 91, so I must have been just 31 or 32, something just, it's only just, I hadn't even heard of it and I'm in a bookstore like 10 to 5, 10 minutes before the bookstore shuts, I thought I want something to read and this will sound so strange, I'm walking along a, a book and this book drops out in front of me. Mm. It was a service thing, prophecy. And I picked it up, I've got to have it. And I took it home. And I know I said I'm not an avid reader. I went to bed about, because I was teaching martial arts at that time. I went to bed about 10 o'clock and I was reading it till half past three in the morning. 
And I found it transformative in what it was sharing. And for me now as a medium or as a tutor, as a teacher, this when people say to me, oh, what book should I start by reading? I always say that book. Although it's uh, it, although obviously it's a it's a friction story and it's set in the time when Peru wasn't the place to go and this this uh, journey goes on this search of these insights. It's a powerful story and obviously after the Sassanian prophecy, there's a whole um, number of books that follow in the series, but the, but the actual first one actually introduces people to, to energy, how energy can work within between people within relationships, how people can have that energy drained from them he calls them control dramas and how relationships you know they can start with such a bang and why do they then burn out fascinating book and the story i just love the whole story I, and even now i can pick it up and read it like it's the first time yeah yeah it is one of those books that that kind of broke through and everyone seemed to be reading it everywhere you went every 20 years or so there's a book that really be, yeah. you know hits the mainstream and this was one of them and, and that- i like you when I read it too, yeah. It's that whole word synchronicity that went right through. And I can remember, and my memory's really, you've met me, you know what my memory's like. You know, I can remember being on a tube and someone was reading the book. I went, I've got a sad to her. And I said, I'm really sorry to bother you, but you're in the book I've got here in my bag. I've got, a dr-. and it was really strange. And it was the whole thing about synchronicity. And when I teach, I say, you, if you like the intuition, it's just, it's opening up to intuition side. And I, I've, I've always described your intuition as the gateway to your soul. When you listen to intuition, you're, you're, it's, that, it's your soul's gateway to communicating with you if you're not into meditation or you're into this sort of stuff. Just by listening to that intuition, that, there's your go. And the same thing, they then, those things then open up more and more and more. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Love that book. The second book is the one that sent me on um, The Goose Chase. They yep. Send Their Love. Memoir and Messages of a Modern Medium by Eamon Downey. And yep. this was only published in 2015, but the weird thing was everywhere I went, I could not find a picture of the cover and the book seemed to be out of print. That's Eamon. I mean, he, he has no interest in publicity, has no interest in, in, in pushing his books or pushing himself. He's, he's an amazing man. I, I, he, I, he will hate it if ever he hears what I've called him my mentor but I've known him a long time and that man is responsible for what I do now. I've, I've had some amazing tutors on my journey. I may, I still have amazing tutors, but he's the one that's guiding me. His, his knowledge of what I call metaphysical work and his energy work and his mediumship and the way he's guided me. Uh, and this book talks a bit about his life, but it also sort of talks a lot about how he got into mediumship. And it's also within the book are some guidelines about opening up to spirit. And I've taken some, I've been on so many of his workshops um, but this is the, again my go-to book. Um, if ever I'm feeling a bit, oh, can I read it? Because all mediums, any medium that says you they don't get down sometimes, or they don't question their work sometimes, basically they're lying. Because we are, you know, it, it can be, you know, we doubt it because we're working with something that's not tangible. And so when working, we go, have I served spirit okay? And I find when I'm around him or reading his book and his guideline, I talk a lot about what I call my meet and greet. It's Eamon that taught me that. And my meet and greet is what if I'm doing a show or a dem like today, when I finish chatting to you, I'm sitting on my bed. I put my little spirit, I've got my little blanket put around me and I link the spirit. And as weird as it sounds, I will meet my first reunion this afternoon for tonight. Often they'll show me where they're sitting, what they're wearing. Don't ask me how it works because you'll go crazy. I'll talk about it later if you like, but it literally they will they'll actually show me what they went. And I and I had someone in fact on Wednesday. I went to this woman, I said, yeah, it's your husband, this, that. And she said, well, I only decided to come 20 minutes ago. I went, yeah, but he knew. How do you know? I don't know. Because we go down the rabbit hole back to about time and space. But, yeah, so Eamon is my um, – he's taken the back, ste- back step a lot. And so he, he's still teaching a little bit. So I've, I've done a couple of workshops with him this year. And it, if, it's, if the book's out of print, my, my copy's worth a fortune because he is. He is one of those unique. I think what it is with him, he's unique in as much that he listened to spirit and tr- and trod his trod, treads his own path. Mm, yeah. And his teaching isn't about go get a better link. He he's the one that taught me. And he's and I say this quote because it's his quote I, I've basically stolen. He always taught me and taught everyone. Mediumship is easy. It's a natural phenomena. We're all mediums. We, our brain gets in the way, makes it difficult. So his focus always has been on how is the medium, how is your process, how is your preparation? And that always resonated with me. And that's what I teach now. I just, when I teach mediumship, I always say, 
it's a journey of personal exploration. Mm. You know, every, mm. everyone can be a million. I'm not one of those natural born who's going to go click. I've got spirit. I have to go through my own preparation process. And he taught me that. He um, teaches at the Arthur Findlay College, which is, you know, famous the world over. And I know I've had several guests on this show who have actually Americans and Australians who have trained there, come specially yeah. to be trained there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been going there 15 years. And I, and I try, I, once I was going there three times a year, I now try and make it once, twice a year, because for me, it's got a little bit expensive. But you'd get a lot of Americans, Australians over yeah. there. And he was a tutor there. He pulled away for a while, but he's, he's back. Next year, I've already, booked, I've already booked the course for next year because so I just like being in his energy. Yeah. And there's a lady called Jackie Wright who's now president of the, of the SNU, and I've studied under her. And the two of them together, well, I can just sit in their energy and just learn and just take on board. I think that's the thing is, you know, you never stop learning. No. You know, and I'm always just scratching. You know, my work is just scratching the surface. You know, yeah. you can always get that better reunion. You can always just serve spirit. That's, that's a bit of a cliche, but you can always serve spirit that little bit better. I do like yeah. the way you describe it as a reunion because that's exactly what it is for people. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, 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 that's, that is actually my, I, in fact, um, Eamon used that a lot, but I, I've taken it as kind of, these are reunions. I mean, again, his, his teachings, when I teach, for me, whenever there's a, a reunion from spirit to a loved one, there's always three parts. It's a life lived. Who was it? It might be your dad, whose name was Fred, yet lovely, and, and then it's a life shared what you shared, maybe the, the passing, how important it was that you were together. But the most important part of any reunion is the life reunited. It's showing the person in front of you that they're not dead. Yeah. They're, they're, as here. they're not in the past. They're here with you now. They're here with you. I, I can't change that physical missing, but they go, oh, my God, that's my dad. It might be a silly, it might just be a very silly validation. It happened to me on Wednesday, and it was a, a silly validation about a broken plug socket. And it was a white plug socket. And the woman, I'm not, I've got no white plug sockets. So I said, well, check it. There was one in the wardrobe at home that her husband broke the week before. And it's white. <laughs> the rest are all chrome. So, it's a, so that, for me, is a lovely validation yes. that they're in the here and now. Yeah. And that is, you know? that is so the that, kind of detail that people are looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I don't look any membership. But you, I like, I, between me and you, I like a bit of gossip. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's all lovely getting your nan, but, you know, was your nan an naughty girl with the next door neighbour? You know, it's just like, it's getting, because what it then does, it brings them alive. Yeah. You know, I, of course you've got to be evidential and you've got to have a validation for them. But once they know it's their mum, well, it's like someone you love brings you up. They don't spend 10 minutes proving it's them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and again, I've been saying that's why I just say it's, it's a natural process. You know, maybe it's a natural process mm. in my view. So book number yeah. three, this is a kind of, you know, your journey into the, um, you know, psychedelic medicines. This was BMT yeah. and the soul of prophecy, a new science yeah. of spiritual revelation in the Hebrew Bible by Rick Strassman. That one was published in 2014. Yeah, th this is an incredible read. And I find, I find it a bit difficult because I'm not the most scientific of people, but I kept working through it. Uh, what I found fascinating was DMT is it can be called they, they call it the sacred molecule or the uh, the soul molecule. Mm. And DMT is produced by the, the body anyway. It's, it's produced in the uh, penile gland and also they they think now in the stomach, but they're not really quite sure. But it gives a psychedelic effect, and you, and a lot of the references in the Old Testament really sound like there was a use of psychedelics or natural, or as I call them, natural medicines. Yes. You know, sacred yeah. medicines, and that I view, you know, I view anything from a mushroom to uh, to ayahuasca to buffo to smoke or whatever. You, it's a sacred medicine. You know, if you have dandelion tea, it's a sacred medicine. Yeah. You know, you, you can, you know, it's or the blue lotus flower. You know, you have a you dry blue lotus flower tea. It's a you know they use that in ancient Egypt. Um, and I, what I liked with his book was it was so referenced, so researched, and you think, oh my god, when they talk about. Uh, who could do prophecy, the prophecies, and how they all tie in with sacred medicines. Oh, I loved it. You know, and, and again, it's part of my journey has been with sacred medicines over the last five, six years now. Um, and one of the other books ties in with it. And it's, I've had a hell of a, a hell of a journey with the, you know, I've, 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 I've drunk uh, the Madre, the, the mother medicine, the ayahuasca quite a lot and done uh, a few other, things we try to lay the buffo toad smoke and it does it, it alters how you view life 
Mm. It gives you a different life experience. Did you read this book before or during that journey? During, during. Uh, I I read the first one as well, but this one is the one that I go, oh, my, because I have an interest in the Bible. I have an interest because I, we're talking about the next book. I have an interest in that. I have a great question in mind. I don't accept everything. But you start looking at things. When you look at things from like, oh, my God, these guys were connected with uh, with sacred psychic medicines and they view life differently and there's different life forces, different energies. And if they're connecting with that, you start going, oh. You know, you start reading, I think it's one section where the, the, the rabbis go into the sacred space and I think, they, I think it's the acacia bush they burn. They come out and they're off their head. But they're not, but they're connected with spirit, yes. you know. Yeah. But if you think, and I don't want to go into any rabbit holes unless you want to, but we're, we are encouraged, we are programmed not to connect with that source. Mm. We're, you know, we're, well, we are. And, you know, again, and no disrespect to anybody, if you look at how the church works, you can only go through one way to get to, well, actually, we all have a divine connection. You know, and I, again, we'll talk about the Bible in a minute, but, but Jesus always said, or the Christ comes always said, I am the way to the light. Yeah, not him, but love is the way to the light. And the only and the only thing we have in this life is love. The only thing we take with us is the memory of love. Got that good bit, yeah. That's all we take with us. You know, you, you come into this world with nothing. We we experience love in all, in all its different facets, good, bad, different, and we take the memories of this experience. You know, when I when I work, I always say to people, if your mum or dad had this dementia or Alzheimer's, that doesn't go with them. The memory of it goes with them. It's like me and my trans journey. I don't cross over being trans. I cross over going, oh, that's my memory of that life experience. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, 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 I, and I, for me, the DMT or the sacred medicine gets you in touch with a part of you that goes, actually, a lot of this life is BS and what's important. And that book was, uh, uh, for anyone that's interested in DMT or the hit, not so much the, the, or the sacred medicine, but the history of it, it's a really good read. Yeah, and there's it's quite a quite a few books um, emerging now. Um, one in particular, um, and I can never remember the guy's name, um, but he he talks about how you know all of the Greek um, philosophers, you know, they had their oh. schools and how they were taking medicine um, yeah. back then, and that's how they you oh. know, in, enhanced their own consciousness. Yeah, I mean, you look at ayahuasca as a, as, a, as a classic example. You've got this amazing medicine that's taken from a vine and a bark. That's like, so it's, it's basically two medicines wrapped together because one suppresses, because the body can't absorb DMT. It's got that uh, 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 enzyme, MRI, I can't pronounce it, but it's called MRI. So the, the one part of the, one of the plants suppresses the MRA, the other one lets it, is DMT and lets it get absorbed. And, that's, and you think, where does that intelligence come from? Out of the 100,000 plants in the Amazon, some put those two together. You think, well, there's got to be a, a consciousness behind that. You know, it just has to be. Yeah. You know, in, and even with plants in the garden, I mean, I've last week I've got into a little bit of gardening. And to watch a, a seed go from that to like a huge, how does it know? Mm. You know, how does it know? It just does it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, but but number I, you know, four, you mentioned the Bible. Yeah. Yep. You love the Bible. I like I, I love right when I say I love the right I and I like reading the Bible. It doesn't mean I'm religious because I'm not. I love the I, I love the spiritual movement, but for me, religion is a I, for me spirituality is spirituality. But something like the Bible is a way of controlling your spirituality. That's only my view in a lot of ways because it doesn't encourage you to be an individual. Mm. So my mm. love of the Bible goes back to when I was a child because I was I up in a Christian childhood, and I remember I can remember the picture stories of Daniel in the lion's den, and and then I became a choir boy. Um, I couldn't sing, but I've got I like wearing the blue dress on a Sunday, so I quite enjoyed that really. <laughs> uh, but I but I, I I read the Bible, so I'm quite well read. I mean, I'm not read read in the Bible, but I can take parts. And go, yeah, I like I like the message of it. I don't like the way the messages are sometimes cherry picked. And I, and I get the New Testament was like written years afterwards. It's gone through loads and loads of translations. So for me, it can only be a guy. It's a guidebook. But I enjoy tipping my toe into it. Going, I like that bit. And I go, well, you know, but I, I don't just start going, me personally, I don't take every word as gospel because of the way it's been translated all the way through and all the certain books that may not be put in there for whatever reason. But and then you can look at the Old Testament as a completely different for me, and um, I look at the Old Testament and I go, well, 
that's if you could read Hebrew, the Hebrew version, then you'll get the, the you'll yeah. get the pure text. But I'm reading something that's probably been translated again and again and again. So even with the Old Testament, you're not getting the true words unless you can read Hebrew. And you go right the way back and you study the old. I th I'm told there's an older verse. Then, but I don't. So I can only view it. It's like it's a bit like having an atlas and someone's redrawn it a few times for you. You go, oh, that's roughly the way. There's my guide. Mm. You know, and if you look at G, the Christ consciousness, whether, whether you believe Jesus is an actual person or there's a consciousness behind it, the, he speaks one words. You know, so he speaks just a few words, love and forgiveness. Unconditional for love, unconditional for forgiveness. If you can follow that, you're halfway home. Maybe it also makes it complicated. You say that you know, um, Matthew 17 is a great go-to when talking to anyone about mediumship. Why is that? Yeah. Well, Matthew 17, especially if you get people go, you mustn't do this and you get, you, you, it's, it's disgusting, it's evil, and they quote the Old Testament. Yep. If you, you know, if you go to the Old Testament, lots of things are evil, you know. Speak bad to your mum, dad, stoned to death. I mean, there's a lot of examples in the Old Testament where most of us shouldn't be around, you know. But when, I, when anyone says, about, oh, yes, it's evil, it's this now, I say, well, okay, read Matthew 17. And Matthew 17 is the transfiguration of Jesus. It's where Jesus and two disciples, John and, oh, God, I can't remember the other one, they go up the mountain and um, it's a shaft of light. Jesus gets overshadowed by God. He speaks the word of God. So for me, that is beautiful chance. Means he's speaking the word of the divine. Then he calls up this. Then he go. Then he calls to, in the spirits. I think it's Moses and Elijah. So he's a medium. He's but the best medium ever. And then he talks about healing. He was a healer. So Jesus was a medium and a healer. And he said, go and do my work. And he was also a six. He said, you must not talk about this till I've gone. So he was foretelling his own passing. So, you know, I just I see, I see Jesus as such a spiritual being on this earth at that mm. time. But obviously, again, you start saying to people, you can do you can link with God yourself and you've got you can do what he can do. Suddenly it becomes, well, you do, why do you need a church? Why do you need power? I'm not saying that is the reason, but it, it's 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 not spoken right. And, and often if I talk to someone about the whole track that whole part of the bible they go no it doesn't mean that well i think you're right it does mm. so yeah so I, I, again i i, I like I, you know, I i've read like the end of days and and you can read all sorts of symbolism into it and there's a lot of symbols and the other thing obviously with the bible like a lot of religions, there is so many stories yeah. that go right through if you look at the the, the flood and you look at and we're going to talk about him in a minute but this the work done on something called the younger dryas and whether when the flood myth actually might have come from almost every single culture has a flood story behind it. And yeah. it all traces back to roughly the same time. Mm. You know, so I'm not saying the ark didn't have two of every animal there, but it probably didn't. But it might have done, but I'm not saying but but what you does, you you've got those stories that run right the way through so many cultures. And the mm -hmm. same thing with the Jesus story, the birth of a virgin to a virgin. It all goes through them. So there's, a, there's, there's for me, and it ties in, and we might wait in a minute, is that how there's an un, um, an unspoken story or a culture with, a culture with amnesia. You know, there's, there's so much there. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I think I, I love both. So it's not, it's not something I use as a way to live my life. It's a way, it's a way of, like, I look at going, I love the, I love the message of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Book five, Fingerprints of the okay. Gods. Yeah. Graham Hancock, The Evidence of Earth's Lost Civilization, yeah. published in 1995. Yeah. You've got a lot of respect for him, and so do I. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, he, my, he has been, uh, obviously, I've never met the guy. He has had such a huge influence over my life. From the first time I picked the book, his book up to his latest work, where he's now back in South America, he's been to Brazil doing, I think, South America doing some more work. He has been instrumental in making people question things, and he's, and he's inspired so many other people. Uh, I come as there's, there's an Australian guy who has just got one of the the the, 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 va, the va, he calls it a vase from uh, from a private collection, but from from what was meant to be Egyptian. The quality of this workmanship is impossible to do without computerized technology, and Graham. Sort of, opened my eyes to that the, all the questions and it just resonated you know we talk about the great pyramids well these, there's these pyramids all over the flipping earth everywhere mm -hmm. you know people don't realize and it was him that got me into ayahuasca because what happened with him he was mentioning ayahuasca and then he bought out a fiction book based around that and then um it was a friend of mine that told me about a retreat you could go to and that was the start of my my, my sacred medicine journey was really um 
for, through his writings and hearing him and hearing him on, on interviews. But he's but he's done so much work, and, and it's such a shame he's been so pillared by mainstream media. And you know his his early work, he he went and researched work on the um, oh my brain's gone dead on the um, Ark of the Covenant, and he went to go and investigate that. And he's and he's he doesn't make himself out to be an archaeologist. He just says, "I'm a journalist. I'm just exploring. Here's what I found." And his latest work, or his latest book, or one of his latest books, when he spoke about the Young Dryas, he works with a guy called Randall Carson, who's an amazing guy. He's a physicist, a geologist type. Guy. And the things they've uncovered about the, the flood that happened, the flood that happened, and the Young Dryas is now a fact. And it goes, oh. And then it, from, I, don't, I haven't read him write too much about it, but you start reading about all the caves that are under the, under the earth that were man-made. And you start thinking, okay, really? And then you start looking at some of the archaeological uh, evidence that's left behind. You think they really made that with copper chisels and hammers? You, 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 you know, so I've got, so I have such an open mind in my life. I just think, okay, you know, Atlantis, they're now talking that maybe being uh, on, on, the, on the west coast of Africa and you start looking where the Great Lakes were in Africa. It, may, it just makes you question everything. And he really yeah. is the man that started it all for me. Have you um, been watching uh, Ancient Apocalypse on Netflix, his series about Gebekli Tepe. Oh, was that, was that? Yeah, was that that's his series? In, that's oh. the series on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. I, I watched it all. Yeah, you know, it's like, yeah. and there again, he he wasn't trying to tell. He was did it so brilliantly, just questioning, and the and the the backlash. You start thinking, <laughs> what program you, were you watching? What I was watching. You yeah. know, he's just yeah. suggesting this is yeah. this, but it, it's again, you come. Is there an agenda? You just think someone's got a narrative going on. That you can't just mm -hmm. go, okay, let's talk about it, you know. And and I remember again, and it's on YouTube, I think he was in, he got, well, when Hawass was in charge of e Egyptian e antiquities in, in Egypt, they set up a debate. And Gordon Hank, because because uh, their, their argument in Egypt was, oh, it can't be that old because there's nothing in the world that's that old too. And then came, then along came Go Bexley Tepe. And Graham went, well, what about this? And, and Hawass went, oh, I've no, never heard of it. You just know he had. So it's just like, and I think I think a lot of people got so much invested in the current narrative, the current story, that they can't say, "Yeah, we're wrong," or "Let's change our minds," you know. Yeah, yeah. and the same is happening, you know, with the Bosnian pyramids and Dr. Sam Osmanagic, and you know, yeah. some of the carbon dating there is back to something like forty. 46,000 yeah. years. I mean, and and further still. Yeah, and you know, the mainstream don't want to accept it. But, it was like in America, know, they were saying, yeah, they're like in America, they're saying there was, there was no one here for like for, since 10,000 years ago. And they, someone actually dug deeper and went, look, and they went, they ruined his career. And now it's come out. There was a, not, I can't remember what they're called, but there was a, they're actually, it gets, the American things get older and older and older. And there was a guy who actually came on the Joe Rogan. Um, he's got a land up in Alaska somewhere and he's found like this. They keep having all these mammoth tusks, all these men that died overnight. All the, all the, all the, all the, all the big fauna died almost overnight in America. And like, well, people didn't, you know, but then they try and say, oh, well, they got eaten. No, they didn't. They, 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 a whole, you, know, you don't wipe out a whole species by just eating them. You know, it's like, no. So I had this deep question in mind about our past as well as our future. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're not the only one, certainly people who watch this particular show. Well, we're yeah. going to take a short break now. You're listening to a new BS Spiritual Book Club interview and sharing the 10 books that had the biggest influence on her life journey is one of Britain's most loved mediums, teachers and sacred medicine practitioners, Bex Sawyer, whose impressive clairvoyant skills and gifts really came to the fore after she went through her own physical and emotional transition as a transgender woman. We'll be back with more of Beck's 10 Best Lists after this break. Om Times TV. Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and when I'm not hosting Om Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. 
Books are my life, my joy and my passion. And there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com. Click on the Work With Me tab and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. I wanted to talk to you about a program called the Dream Arc and a retreat that we're doing. I want to invite you along. And the Dream Arc is a, is a dream technology. And, and even the latest physics is suggesting now that reality is not what we think it is, that it's kind of a construct. And that the Dream Arc teaches us how to use the full operating system to navigate our brain frequencies between waking and sleeping and dreaming and to move through the inner realms and the outer realms seamlessly. And you will work in the Dream Arc with certain animals that will come to you, maybe in real life, maybe through your intuition, in magical ways, or perhaps through, you know, just dreams that come to you. It's filled the dream up with invitations and suggestions and tasks that you, you choose intuitively. You choose the ones for you. You don't know what you're choosing, but they come to you. You know, so please join us as we dive down the wormhole into the dream arc and let's see what happens. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Beck Sawyer, book number six, On the Side of Angels, Gordon Higginson's Life Story by Jean Bassett, published in 1993. Yeah, never met the man. Uh, probably the best known medium uh, within the SNU, within modern spiritualism. Uh, he was the head of the SNU for 20 years. Uh, tirelessly worked for them, but he started being trained for this by his mum when he was, I think, about four years old. But his mediumship was so evidential, so amazing, it's still spoken about today. But what I like about this book, and I, it was interesting because when I was doing my list, I picked up and just thought, I'll just read a chapter. And it was a chapter about where he was, again, pillared and ripped apart by the press and how he nearly gave up on it and nearly walked away from it. And a lot of people don't know that about Gorn. He was, he, in his own way, he was very vulnerable. And the book talks about from a young age, his time in the army. I think he was, if I'm right, he was stationed in Malta in the Second World War. So he went through lots. And then he dedicated, dedicated his life to service, to spirit. And that's inspired me. And, I, and I, whenever I work, I would say to people, when I get in what's called the power and I start, with, that's when I come alive. That's why I'm in this body this lifetime because it's taken me long enough to get to do this. And I don't, I'm loving this. I'm going to go to the gym for an hour after I finish chatting to you. But I know when I drive to the dem or the show tonight, the event, that's when I come up. And that was like, and that's, I feel that's how he was. You know, he had a troubled personal life at times, I feel, but he was such an inspire, 
inspirer. And it becomes quite, uh, the lineage becomes really interesting because he had four or five, what I would call protégés. One was someone called Mavis Batilia, who I was fortunate enough to know really well and studied under her as well. Uh, there was Eamon, who I've mentioned, Eamon, Eamon Down. He was also very close to Gordon. And there was a couple of others called Paul Jacobs and the guy, uh, oh, the other ones got out of my head, but they were all close to him. So I've been very blessed to be part of that, that line, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. And I felt him close a couple of times because I, I go to the college and you'll feel his energy. And I felt him close a couple of times, just almost like checking me out and going, I hope I'm doing okay. Um, but he is, he, he's been a major influence, not just on, on my development, but my, my mentor's development. And so it's, it's, and it's a great read. If you've got any interest in like, the history of spiritualism, it's a great place to start. I mean, I, I know uh, there's a library at the college and I've studied a little bit, but I'm, I'm not, I don't, I can't call myself knowledgeable on the history of modern spiritualism, like some are. But for me, Gordon, along with a few others, are, are pivotal people in the expansion of spiritualism in this country, in the UK and the world. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, book number seven. It's a little bit of a switch here. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe ah. with C.S. Lewis. What a yeah. treat. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this for me is so special on so many levels. Uh, as a child reading it, it was my escape go-to. You know, as a little mm -hmm. boy, I don't if I'm any, the whole trans politics is, oh, I'm going like, really, at the moment? I, I, I'll talk about me if you want later on. But it's just like, but I would... I would fantasize about going through that wardrobe, strange land, coming out as a girl. And, and it was such pure escapism. Obviously, the depth of it, the philosophy behind it, what, what, who Aslan really was meant to be. Oh, I was lost in like a, an eight, nine year old child. But I loved it, loved it, loved it. And then later on in life, I, I got a big hard copy and I'd read that to my son when my son was young and he loved the book as well. And of course, when the films came out, uh, it brought it into another escapism for me. Um, and of course, I, I think with that, with anything with C.S. Lewis, I, I think there's such an escape. There's also a, such a message behind it. Mm. You know, you've, you've got sibling rivalry that becomes sibling love. You've got, you know, you, you, you've got the temptation of the Snow Queen and, and then you've got the right word, right, right, wrong, the forgiveness. It's so, oh, I'll get a, I'll get a goose by me. There's such a thread behind each of the stories. But yeah. for me, it comes back to what the initial hook was. It was my escape book. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, 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 I would have, you know, I don't remember it, but I, but I probably as a little boy would have hidden the wardrobe thinking like, where's my Narnia? You know, <laughs> it's like, it was such, an, it's, it was such an important book for me growing up. I had to have it. I had to have it in my choice. Yeah, yeah. of course you did. Yeah. yeah. Number eight, another one that's quite unusual. Zen yeah. and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Percy. Yeah. 1974. This is one of the first books I probably ever picked up because I might well have picked it up thinking it was a motorbike book because as a youngster, I was into motorcycles. And then, then I got into it in a big way and I became a teacher and a motorcycle and all the advanced. And we had a core friends, but we, we were all quite philosophical. And I think we all went through a phase of reading that book. My memory was quite poor. I didn't want to pick it up again, but I remember it being a story of, of going touring through, through America and keeping the motorbikes. And it's like tinkering the motorbike was tinkering, almost like tinkering yourself adapting what's going on and learning um and i i did well, i didn't put the book up again i did i did a little wikipedia app, you know reading back the author went i didn't realize how long it took him to write the book and how many and what was inspiring about this one i was how many refusals he haven't published it before he actually got it published and for me mm. i if you say bex what's the most important part of that book I, go, I can't remember i didn't want to reread it but i just know it sits within my soul about being 14 15 finding it reading it probably not understanding the depth of where it was going, but it opens a door. And that's what I think happens with the synchronicities of life. A book comes along or you bump into someone and it can just be a sentence. You know, I've had it in my work, you know, I've had it through work. You know, I, you give someone a, a, a message from a loved one and that can transform their life. And it is literally yes. a moment in time. And that comes back to talk about my, sort of my work is that you know, I'm serving spirits. So, I've got to get out of the way so spirit can do their job. And it is because they spirit know the work they want to do for their loved one. And it is a bit like that book. It might be a moment of time that sits in them forever, but changes how they view life. And that's what that book did for me. I can't remember the context of it or the contents of it so much, but I remember the effect it had on me when I had it and I'd read it and go, I try to make it understood it, but I was 14 or 15, you know, I, 
but it always just, you know, we'd, um, then it led to our friends. We'd sit, I can remember like 18, 19, sitting with friends in the motorbike, maybe little 21, sitting in the motorbike group after going a motorbike ride, talking about, well, is life all a dream? Are we really all spike? And these are, we're, we're young 20 year olds, like back in the early 80s, when all this stuff wasn't spoken about. Yeah, yeah. You know, and even now I'm still in contact with some of them and we still have these conversations about, you know, what's life? Where's it all about? What's, what's the next step after we pass on, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was when the book. Yeah. Book nine, Prana and Pranayama by Swami Niranjan Ananda Saraswati. 2002. I hope I didn't mangle that. Oh, don't ask me. I would even try and pronounce that one, Sandy. Um, that book, I don't know how I found that book, but it's th- that book is my go-to book on my bedside. My, my, my love and yoga started back with my dad. And my dad, um, I've, 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 my brother's got the copy over in America. And it's a blue heart. I can remember it's been a blue heart book. My dad must have bought it in the 60s when the yoga wasn't even spoken about. And it talked about prana, which is for those that are, for me, prana is, I call it, when I try and explain to people, it's life force. Everything's got life force in it. And we can use that and uh, engage with it and feel it. And so I, I, I was thinking about prana when I was, like, like again, teenager. So, yo, you, this is what I love about in the books. It suddenly realized everything was popping in for a reason. It was, my whole life has been synergistic as well. And going, oh, that happened then for a reason. Then that popped in, that popped in. Until you get where you are now. And this particular book talks about, and I, and I started yoga probably about five years ago. I'm not bendy, I've got, but I've got an amazing yoga teacher. I go to four or five classes a week if I can. And my favorite is the pranayama breathing, is the breathing exercises. And coming back to this book, it explains chakras beautifully. It explains basic breathing ex- beautifully. And, as, as, and I must have the book years. I'm still not more than halfway through it because I get to a point and go, oh, I'll stop reading. And I think I meant to because some of the breathing exercises get so deep so intense and again it's a book i'd recommend to anyone who's looking at prana and and you know breathing exercises um i love it but again i'm not all the way through it i've had it years because it just seems to i start reading again and go i've got lost in that bit which means i've got to go back to it again and even i start i will go back to the start i must have started that book literally a dozen times and go oh and after in the second chapter when i don't remember that bit because i wasn't meant to yeah yeah and you know, yeah, you didn't reach that point yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and i think it's such a deep book i think sometimes in our western world our western life, i think if we got too engrossed in that maybe i'd lose sight of the other things i'm meant to be doing as well that's 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 not me trying to make an excuse but that's me making an excuse <laughs> so, but, but i like but for anyone who's looking to, to explore anything about if you like the philosophical side of yoga or the philosophical side of that it's a beautiful book a beautiful book yeah. Well, your last book is, uh, we're back to the beginning. Um, it's also by Eamon Downey, yeah. and um, it's called The Colour Bible, A Living Energy. This is a very intriguing book. I've looked for it, and I don't think this one's available right now either. So if you've got a copy, hold on to it. <laughs> I, I've actually got a second copy. If you want, Let me know when I see I'll, I'll gift it to you. I've got two copies. I'll gift it to you. That would yeah. be wonderful. I've got Thank two copies because I've got two. I was given one signed by him for me, and I've got and I actually bought one. So I, I've, I'm sure I've got a second copy. I'll dig it out if, I've, if I can find it. I'll gift it to you. And what I love about, again about this book, I, I was never. I, I always loved color, but you go and watch. Oh, what's the color making you feel? And I was like, really? But this book opened my eyes to color as a vibration. It vibrates, obviously, and from that it gives an energy. And then how do you make sure And I explored it and I explored it. And again, he taps into the chakra system. He taps into it. And it's not a thick book. It's like that thin, but it goes through all the different colors and you get a feeling from it. For me, he's an amazing writer. Um, I don't, as I say, I might be out of print. I, it wasn't, he didn't design it to be a massive, massive bestseller. I, I don't suppose. But I loved how it pulled me in to realize color is a vibration. When you see all it counts, I don't see color, but I can look at something. Oh, I know that's great. It's, it's that clear sense. I know that's green. And oh, how's that making me feel? So I feel it now as an energy as opposed to, going, yeah, it's green, whatever. It's not, oh, that green. What is that energy doing to me? So it's, again, it helped my mediumship and helped my psychic development and helps my teaching. Yeah. Yes, and someday when we're having a, a glass of wine and we're not yeah. on air, I'll tell you yeah. a few stories about colour um, that uh, you will you will uh, definitely relate to. Um, yeah, colour is such a fascinating thing 
the way that it can be used to change your mood, change the energy. Oh, yeah. Um, and the way we respond to colour. I mean, that blue you're wearing, you know, I can't take my mind off it and my eyes oh, off it because it is so vivid. And it is such a it has a it has a feeling, yeah. you know, that really lifts you up. Yeah. I was thinking, oh, I want to wear something nice. And then I'm not saying this isn't nice, but it's a t shirt. I looked at it, I've got to wear that. And again, it's that interesting. Yeah, it's oh, well, I like that then. It's yeah. So Yeah. And it it's true. Colour is just an incredible thing. Well, that's your ten best list. And you know, obviously I've got some questions about you and the work that you're doing. One of the things I want to know is, um, were you aware of your mediumship abilities when you were young? I, I had a strange time growing up. Um, as a little boy, I wanted to chat to spirit people or dead people, but got nothing. And I was only with my mum, before my mum, not long before my mum passed, she went to me, I knew I had a best friend called Girl growing up when I was very small, but I didn't realise this best friend girl was with me from about 18 months to the age of about five when I started school. And she went everywhere with me. So was she a spirit friend? Don't know. Might have been. But I was always drawn to spirit. And But I got nothing. My whole world was fantasy land of trying to escape being a boy. And as a little boy, I just wanted to be a mermaid, which was great at seven, a bit rubbish at 28. So, so I was stuck in my imagination world a lot of the time. And I grew up in, and I grew up, there's a very well known medium here called Doris Stokes. And I'd growing up watching her, and I just want to do that, but it got nothing. I sat in development circle in my 20s, got a little bit, but then just it petered out. And then along came the very famous medium, Colin Fry. And he worked with someone called Tracy Higgs, or actually, no, Tracy quite well, and, and Tony Stockwell. I'd watch them on telly going, that's all I want to do. Oh, and Devika Cora. I'd watch them go, that's all I want to do. And I'd get so angry, not at them, but frustrated. And it wasn't until I started going through my own emotional, physical transitions, did somehow the right tutors come along. It was an overlap. As I hadn't actually started transitioning, but I was, I was looking at facial surgery and things like that. And, and it's, it was a slow osmosis. Almost, It's almost like they've gone hand in hand. But again, it ties in what I say about mediumship is a personal journey of exploration. You've got to be open to being you. Otherwise, you can't do mediumship. Oh, because otherwise your brain, the job of the memes get their brain out of the way so spirit can do their job. I'm now in a place where if I get up on stage or on platform, whatever I'm doing, I don't worry whether I'm trans, man, woman. I'm just up there out of the way serving. So I, don't get me wrong, I love my I love my work. I love the interaction with public. But it's a journey I've had to go on to find the place where I'm at now. So it's really gone hand in hand. You know, um, there are only in every generation, you know, there's only a small handful of people love mediums, but there's only a few that really, you know, make the big time, if yep. you know what I mean, and yeah. get widely, widely known. Did you ever imagine that you would become so well known? Oh, don't you see, I, I go, when you say, I go, what, well, really? Um, I, 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 I just, what I try and do is, I, uh, I, I, I'm a great believer. I just keep my head down. I do what I do. I, I do what I love and what I was, I'm here on the planet to do, if you like. And I'm blessed to have, still have some amazing tutors. I've just done what I did a week, the other week at the, at the college with an amazing tutor who works amazing with energy. Um, but the energy is first, then the ministry second. It's working the two together. And that was an amazing week. So, again, I'm always scratching the surface. I am, I am very blessed to, that people seem to like the way I work, which is lovely. Um, but... If someone said to me 20 years ago, Bex, you're going to transition. You're going to be in front of hundreds of people doing your work. I'd have gone, yeah, well, you know what you can do. That's never going to happen. But it has. And it's evolved into where I'm like chatting to you now about mediumship. And it's, it's um, yeah, it's been a journey and a half, Sandy. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I say to people, you know, I, I, there's a lot of trans stuff going off at the moment. And I, I, I try not to get involved because, I always try and see everyone's side of the story, you know, and I, I don't get myself shot from both sides. Um, you know, I, I, I had someone say to me the other week, well, like, you're not a natural biological woman. I went, well, no, really? I was born with something you wasn't. I won't say the word I was going to say, but I was born with one of those. Of course I'm not a biological woman. I'm Bex, and hopefully people like me. I'm, I'm, I'm on my journey. But, and, but, what's happens is, but what, I've, what I do love, uh, if there's one thing about being trans, there's not many things you love about being trans, but I can see both sides. It's being empathic. It makes you more of an empath. You, I get men's perspective. I get women's because I, I'm, 
you know, we were called twin souls. You know, if you look at you know, the, the, the Native Americans, they would call us twin souls. They'd recognize five genders. I think it's one of the sides. So I get my part, but it makes me a different type of medium. Yeah. Mm. And you say that um, you're a, a star being. Yeah, I'm a great. You see, this is where. Right, right. What it means to me is, is that I think there's some of us that have come here and. I, again, was the biggest sceptic with this, you know, really. But it came through the medicine. It came through the madre. And uh, the first time it happened, I was, I was on, a, on a retreat. And ayahuasca is, I'd say to anyone, if anyone's watching this, is that if you're going to explore special sacred medicine, make sure you're in a sacred space that holds you. Unfortunately, there are people now exploring, experiment with, with ayahuasca. Don't even think it. It's sacred. Even as something as with mushrooms, I'd say make sure you're in a sacred hold when someone's holding space for you, you know. So I was on this particular, you know, it's it's I, I was blessed when I found this retreat I went to and I said I've drunk a lot, but every time I felt safe, I could cry, I could release, I could purge, knowing I was being held. And it is it, you know, when you're doing the medicine, you are you become totally vulnerable. And that's part of my path, is I was never good at being totally needing anyone or trusting. And the med the marge isn't a place where I was dying, felt I was dying and had someone you know, yeah, it, it changes how you view life. And anyway, one one particular journey towards the end, we're, we're up just up dancing. And Marge I went to me, step into the blue light. I went, What? And there's a blue light coming down. I went, okay. So I stepped in the blue light, and it just gave me an experience of going, I'm connected to the stars, the planets. And again, there's a lot of people trying to make a lot of money out of it. Yes, you're true and you're Palladian. This is, I just shared this. And I think there's more to this than anyone knows. And if you're interested, you've got to explore it for yourself and make sure, again, if you're exploring it, you explore it from a place of safety and a place of trusting whoever you're doing it with. You know, and, and for me, I, I, it really made me aware of, 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 a, of, a, of, of, a, of me being a blue, oh God, almost like angelic, extraterrestrial being whatever but that okay is that me or is that an influence over me i'll let you know when i get there you know if i if, when, when my time comes and i cross over if there's a spaceship waiting for me i was right if there's not a spaceship there my brain got in the way you know the brain always gets in the way you know it's just even when i do my mediumship I, I say i made a mistake i will make see means i aren't told they can make mistakes but when i'm teaching i'll say i'm going to make mistakes i'm working my brain will get in the way yeah so it's only like oh that, that's that's my ego get out of the way you apologize and move on. And same with this. You know, if I cross over and I'm just, this, just in spirit, oh, okay. But if there's more to it, I'll know. The thing is, you won't need a spaceship. No, no <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you won't exactly. Need yeah. Yeah. Do you, yeah. do you no, feel, exactly. I mean, you know, to, to um, transition, I know yeah. what's involved in that. You know, I ghosted one of Britain's most famous, um, you know, long past now, trans um, gender women. I ghosted her autobiography. So I, I know exactly what is involved in that. And it is not a journey for the lighthearted. It is not an easy journey by any means. And I have tremendous respect for anybody oh. who will go to those lengths to be who they are. Do you, do you feel that, I mean, clearly you're so happy with what you're doing now the work that you're doing and everything I've heard you are so good at it and people love you for it do you kind of feel like that's a little reward not that you need one but it's a nice little you know you've gone through so much and now you can rest in the fact that you're doing what you love and being who you are yeah I mean I've had to work through and this is a personal part of my my journey I've, I've I, I'm still I have worked still working through a lot of guilt because when you change one life, it leaves other people in the wake and it changes people you love. It changes their perspective of you. Um, so, yeah, I st I, you know, if some could wave now, this that's a really great question. Because if someone said, here's a magic wand, we can t make you just a normal man and you'll be happy with your bits. You'll be happy to look in the mirror and not want to kill yourself. You'll be, you won't want 20 hours. Well, I've had 20 hours of facial surgery. You won't want that all done. You won't want to change your bits because my first facial surgery was 12 hours of just a bone work. So, you know, I've been through a bit, but and if someone, well, everything would stay okay, there'd be part of me going, well, that'd be lovely because my relationship with my, 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 my children, my relationship with my fam, my family, it, will, it wouldn't cause any ructions. It would be, 
but then I go actually when I when I like Happy Wednesday and someone's dad reunited with her daughter and the the, the reunion Sandy was so beautiful I, I can't remember what I said but she was like oh my god and when I, I can't remember what I said there's something I said at the end almost like a throwaway comment she went no one knows that and I'm holding I went and gave her a hug and when I give a hug sometimes spirit sounds really weird but it's like film ghosts it's almost like they overshadow me and they hold them i call it a hug from heaven it sounds weird but it's actually true it's a hug from heaven and i like, so if i'm part of that and i hold someone you go well that's why i'm here so that's why i'm here do you think that if you hadn't made the transition you wouldn't have become a medium you wouldn't have gone pushed yourself out there i i don't think my ministry would, would have I don't think my ministry would have manifested if I'd stayed in that male energy body because there was still the anger side and, and it wasn't like, it was almost like energetically I knew I had to go through everything to be this, because by being trans or being this open as me, I can see both sides. And so it makes me, I think, as an empath, it makes me more able to get out of the way and f feel a man's anger at something. Oh, yeah, he really hated that football team because I can feel that as a kid or whatever. So I don't think... I tried to develop my membership as a man when I was in my late twenties, just didn't work. So I think I had to go through this to be this. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. yeah. And you, you have, um, you know, a really healthy Facebook following and you do meditations every morning, don't you? Yeah. Five mornings a week during lockdown. We start, I started from during lockdowns. So I started with just the phone and me and it got to say something, we got a bigger screen and a nice webcam and, I call this big mic, my professional microphone. And we, it's like we're, doing, uh, we're doing online meditation seven mornings a week. And I was doing six nights a week online. It was all free. But the meditation now is about five mornings a week. But I've got a, like a meditation page, groups. We've got literally hundreds and hundreds of meditations up there because we're doing it every day. Yeah. So even now it's nice. We get, you know, I don't get hundreds. But I, don't, I haven't tried to go out there getting hundreds. I just believe the right people will find it. And it helps the right people at the right time. Some have been with me for three and a half years and it started. Some pop in once and go, oh, my God, thank you. Never see him again. But it's all okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, try and do a monthly, I try and do a monthly meditation, a uh, mediumship night online as well. Because when I was doing that, because during lockdown, I was doing, I said I was online six nights a week and two of those were mediumship nights. But well, now, because I'm back out there, I can only really get on. I try and get one night a week, for, one night, sorry, one night a month free when we can do a night of mediumship. And that's always quite, that is quite popular. Yeah. We get quite a lot of people on that. It's nice. We get like five, six hundred people on that. It's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time now, Bex. It's been a real joy talking to you. And I want to thank you for adding your 10 best oh. list to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. Oh, Sandy, thank you so much. It, it's been a real journey for me as well. And it's I've loved it. I really have enjoyed it. I've enjoyed chatting to you. But I've, it's It made me realise how... You see, I wasn't, I'm not allowed to read it, but I didn't, it made me realise that books have had such a big influence over me too. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Ah, you're welcome. Our pleasure. So, Bex Sawyer's 10 best lists can be found at the nobsspiritualbookclub.com and you can learn more about uh, her work and uh, everything that she's doing at the website bex, B-E-C-S dash medium dot com. And you can also find her on her Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Bex UK. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 best interview for the No BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me, and thank you. Thank you, Bex. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>